Hello and welcome to The Reviews Brothers. The PlayStation 1 was known as having some of the best 3D games of its era, with consoles showing off some power and graphics that had only been previously available to PC gamers. Many franchises made the move from 2D to 3D on the PlayStation, and Sony even made a conscious effort to focus on 3D, leaving old 2D sprite-based games behind. But that doesn't mean that there weren't any released on the system, and in today's video, we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of them to see if ignoring 2D sprites was a good idea. Now, how about I shut the hell up, you press that subscribe button, and we together take a look at some games. Let's start off with one of the most well-known and beloved 2D games on the system, Rayman from Ubisoft. Rayman was a very early game for the PlayStation and was even touted to be the official mascot at some times. We all know that that didn't happen, but his legacy is still going strong with new games being made today. Anyway, his game here on the PS1 is a beautiful action platform game where you have to explore dozens of levels as the limbless freak, rescuing little purple grape things called lums that have been imprisoned in cages. Right off the bat you can see that the game looks fantastic. The lush hand-drawn worlds all have a ton of character and charm to them and Rayman himself as well as all the enemies are so well animated it really does look like you're watching a cartoon at times. Thankfully, the animation doesn't get in the way of controls, which can sometimes be the case in games like this, and everything here is very responsive, though sometimes it does feel like everything moves a little too slowly. Rayman can walk and jump to start off, but as you progress you'll unlock new abilities, including his now famous punch attack. You'll also learn to grab ledges, glide with your ears and more. As well as this, certain levels are auto-scrollers and you'll meet characters along the way that will help you out. And let me tell you, you are going to need that help, as this game is really freaking hard, and not many people realise that. The levels here are littered with enemies, all of which usually need their own tactics to kill. You can't just run in fisting everyone here. Regular enemies will dodge your attacks and require precise timing and positioning. And of course, every level introduces new enemies that you'll end up hating until you figure out the best way to take them down. As well as this, all the levels have some really tricky platforming in them, with bottomless pits, spikes and other hazards all being present all over the place, and at times the hit detection can feel quite off, especially when you're trying to jump across spike pits. Also, the levels here are pretty large and have loads of lum cages that you'll need to find, and yes, you do need to find every single damn one of them. You can't properly finish the game unless you find all the cages in the game, many of which can be quite hard to find. You'll need to revisit old levels with your new abilities in order to get them, so there's a fair bit of backtracking. I'll be honest, when I realised that you need to get all of the cages, it really made me want to stop playing, as despite the gorgeous graphics, a lot of the levels can be pretty damn tedious. Thankfully, there are passwords and you can save your progress. Overall, this is still an enjoyable game, and anyone that hasn't played it but is looking for a very challenging platform game should do themselves a favour and check it out, even if some of the design choices are definitely a little questionable nowadays. Here is Mickey's Wild Adventure, which I think goes by a few different names depending on what system or region you're playing in. Here you play as Mickey Mouse as you go through some of his classic cartoons throughout the years. The art style here is amazing and everything really does look like the old cartoons. Mickey animates perfectly and has loads of personality, and every level has its own set of enemies and hazards that look right out of the cartoons. Everything has a lot of love put into how it looks, though I do have to admit not so much into how it plays. The game does control well enough, Mickey can jump on enemies heads to defeat them and can also collect ball things to throw which are weaker but mean you can attack from a distance. This is often preferred as the hit detection here really doesn't feel too great. Your hitbox is definitely way larger than the enemy ones and you'll often take cheap hits when trying to jump on enemies, especially the flying ones. Also, a lot of the bad guys here are a real pain in the ass, and some, like the skeletons that appear in a few levels, explode, and here about 10 bones fly erratically all over the screen that are very hard to avoid but will all hurt you. One of the hardest parts of the game for me was in the Mad Doctor's Lair, when you're riding on a cart and you've got to jump over some spikes. I died a ton here, and as much as I hate to be that guy, it really was because of bullshit, and taking cheap, unfair damage from the poor collision detection. 
This is a bit of a shame, as it makes the game a bit of a slog to get through, and there is a great variety in the levels, with some auto-scrollers, nice rotation here, and even some levels where you're running towards the screen, and these all look incredible, but there's no save or password feature, and you only get a handful of lives and continues. This would be fine if the game was a fair challenge, but the cheap damage means most people will likely get too frustrated to bother seeing the whole game. I do have to admit, I haven't beaten it, and I'm unlikely to go back to the game anytime soon. However, if you do love Mickey, it is worth checking out. Other than that though, it is a bit of a tough one to recommend these days. The Adventures of Lomax is an interesting one. It's an action platform spin-off of the Lemmings games, which usually see you solving puzzles to get the suicidal little bastards through some tricky levels. Here you play as Lomax, a lemming knight who has to save his friends who of course have been transformed into monsters by the diabolical Evil Ed. As Lomax you set across Lemming Land, and yes it's really called that, rescuing your mates and kicking Evil Ed's ass. As you can see, the game looks incredible, with some of the best 2D artwork and animation that I think I've seen on the PlayStation. The amount of detail on just about everything here is awesome, and every level has multiple background layers with loads going on. All of the characters here have a ton of animation too, which really grabs you from the get-go. Lomax attacks with a spin attack, which you do by pressing jump twice. This can be a little clumsy and take a while to get used to, but I do feel like it would have been better with a dedicated button, but like I said, you do get used to it. There are power-ups throughout the levels too, and you'll learn new abilities for Lomax as you progress, which ties in nicely to the Lemmings theme. You get various helmets that you can throw to defeat enemies, or extend to latch onto certain surfaces, acting kind of like the hookshot from Zelda, but often if you take a hit you'll lose these abilities. You also get things like wooden planks that you can use to create platforms to reach tough areas. These are all limited in use though, so use them sparingly, or you could find yourself stuck with no option other than kill yourself, which is never fun. As with most platform games, there are plenty of tough platforming sections, and there's loads of bottomless pits and spikes for you to land on. A lot of the time you'll need to learn the level layouts, as you'll definitely not be getting through most of these on your first playthrough. You can collect coins in the levels, and of course a hundred of these give you an extra life, and there's even checkpoints lettered throughout the levels too. Thankfully here, it's just a case of getting to the end of the stage, and you don't have to worry about defeating every enemy or rescuing every lemming, which is always a nice thing. The levels themselves look great, and they've got a decent enough variety. What is nice is that although you can't swim, on levels that do have water in them, if you do fall in, you float for the first time you fall in. Then you have one chance to jump out and land on solid ground. If you don't land on solid ground, then you'll drown. This is a nice way to be a bit more forgiving than a lot of games. Also, there's levels where you have to go back and forth into the background. It's just a nice touch that adds a bit of flair to the game. Honestly, I really don't have too many negatives to say about this one. The main thing would be that the controls, especially the jumping, can be a bit imprecise. I checked out some reviews online and there's quite a few negative ones, but most of these are saying that it was due to the 2D games being overdone at the time. I definitely would have disagreed with those back then, and definitely do nowadays. This is a really fun game, and while it isn't perfect, it is well above average, and I highly recommend that anyone that likes 2D platform games give this one a go. You can't talk about 2D games without mentioning the Metal Slug series, so here is Metal Slug X, the something or other game in the series. I really love the Metal Slug games, and I think I have played most of them, but I honestly couldn't tell you which one is which. All I know though, is that I always have a good time when I am playing them. The games are pretty simple, you choose from one of four characters, all of which basically play the same. You can run, jump, throw grenades and shoot in four directions. While it would be nice to shoot diagonally, this has never really been a thing in Metal Slug unless you've got the machine gun, so it can be forgiven. If you are close to enemies, you can slice their necks with your knife, which is always nice. You'll be tired of me saying this, but the graphics here are just amazing. The Metal Slug series really set the bar for 32-bit 2D sprite work, and it still looks as amazing now as it ever did. There's a crazy amount of animation and detail on just about everything. All the levels have loads going on in the background, and all the characters and enemies look incredible, and are often seen minding their own business before you turn up to ruin their day. You get a load of weapons that help you be the ultimate killing machine too. 
You'll be collecting shotguns, flamethrowers, rocket launchers, bouncing bombs, lasers and more. These all have limited ammo and often require a bit of getting used to to see how they work, but they are always devastating when used correctly. You can only carry one weapon at a time though, so you'll soon find your favourite. There's also tanks, which are actually known as slugs, hence the name. There's also planes, submarines and even a camel you can ride. These all give you extra armour and devastating firepower that often blows holes in the scenery. If you can hang on to these vehicles long enough, when you get to the bosses you'll definitely have an advantage, but that definitely isn't easy to do. There's also so many nice touches in the game, like the level filled with mummies. If you get killed by one, you don't actually die. Instead, you come back as a mummy yourself and can still carry on playing. If you're lucky, you find a cure to turn back into a human, but take another hit before then and you'll die. There's also loads of things littered around the level to give you points. Some of these are food, and if you eat enough food in a short space of time, you actually turn fat. You move slightly slower, but your bullets also turn fat, and I'm sure they do a little bit more damage. There's also POWs in the levels that you can rescue. They'll give you power-ups to help you out in some way, and some will even attack enemies with you. You get a big bonus points for saving all of them at the end of the level if you manage to beat the stage without dying, and you even get to see their names, which really doesn't affect anything, but it's a nice touch. You really can't go wrong with any Metal Slug game, just make sure you don't buy the collection on the PS2 or PS4. I did, and they absolutely butchered the controls in these games, they're almost unplayable. Stick with the Wii collection or just the individual titles. If you haven't played a Metal Slug game, then you really need to sort your life out and play one today. Punky Skunk from Atlas is a more traditional 2D mascot platform game that looks like it would have been just as comfortable on the 16-bit systems as here on the PlayStation. Of course, you play as Punky, a skunk, who has to do the usual mascot thing of stopping an evil professor bloke from being a bastard. So you and your furry friends set out across a few different worlds, killing enemies with your butt stank and making use of your mole mate's inventions. Why are moles always inventors in this sort of thing? Most levels consist of your usual platforming stuff, exploring levels with your goal just being to get to the end. There's plenty of enemies and you'll have that stink attack that is pretty effective against most of them. And to be fair, for the most part the game does play well enough, but it could do with being a little bit faster. What is interesting is that every level gives you a new power up or item to use. These range from parachutes, pogo sticks, rollerblades and of course because it's the 90s, snowboards. These can be turned on and off once you've collected them which is very handy as some of them don't allow you to attack when they're active. The levels themselves all look fine and are generally modelled around the power up that you get but I really did feel like I was playing a Super Nintendo game rather than a PS1 game the whole time. The look and animation is all quite basic and there isn't really any flair or special effects to be found. Even the sound and music doesn't really take advantage of the CD technology and it sounds like something would have put out on the Super Nintendo. Having said that though, I wasn't really say that this is a bad game, but it is definitely nothing special. It is just perfectly harmless. If you do play it, you'll likely beat it quite easily and then just never come back to it and probably forget that it even exists. Which, you know what, that's kind of fine. However, I do think your little brother will probably enjoy playing through it more. Now it's time for me to butcher some Japanese names as the next few games were never released outside of there, at least I don't think they were, so I apologise in advance. This one here is called Kyoro Chan no Purikura Daisakusen, which roughly translates to I've got no fucking idea. A 30 second Google however shows me that Koyoro Chan, who I'm assuming is the demented parrot thing, is the mascot for a chocolate brand and ended up getting his own PS1 game. Now that's all I know, so let's just see how the game is, shall we? Immediately the game reminds me of Yoshi's Story or Yoshi's Island with a similar art style to those games and some very similar music. It even plays kind of similar, but not really. So yeah, you're the freaky bird nut thing and you explore a bunch of quite short levels collecting chocolate nuts and pecking enemies to death. 
In fact, you usually have a few different attacks. You can peck, jump on their heads, or even butt stomp depending on what enemies you're fighting. The nuts you collect also act as your health. You can have up to 100, and if that goes down to zero, then you're a dead nut. Thankfully, there are nuts all over the place, and I think I only ever died actually once when I fell down a bottomless pit. So yeah, the game is actually quite easy. It's also pretty damn strange, and I don't know why, but I kind of like it. There are microphones all over the levels which either give you hints that are all in Japanese of course, so I've got no idea what they're actually saying, or sometimes they cause things to happen on the level, like new platforms appearing etc. Pressing the circle button makes you shout into the mics, and honestly I really love doing this, as Kuro-chan is just so damn cute, kind of like those disabled dogs that people adopt. For the most part, Kuro controls pretty well, though he is a little too slow and you really need to build up momentum to get going. This can be especially annoying when jumping sections as you need a big run up, which you don't often have. He does a little flutter thing the same as Yoshi does to help you get a bit of extra height and length, but I did find that this was too easy to lose momentum and you end up walking at a snail's pace. Graphically, the game isn't particularly impressive, but I do kind of like how it looks. It's colourful and has a lot of character and humour in there. Also, the sound of music here is pretty great and I enjoyed pretty much everything I heard here, even though the music can loop quite quickly. The levels have some nice variety too. There's clear influences from other games like Donkey Kong Country, but these do come off as homages rather than rip-offs. It does seem like a surprising amount of effort went into polishing the mechanics here, as other than the momentum issue, the game really does play quite well. You never felt like there was poor hit detection or anything like that. Overall, I would definitely say that this is a bit of a hidden gem. It kept me wanting to play, and I would recommend checking it out if you like these sorts of games. You really don't need to know any Japanese to enjoy it. Next is Gigi Gi no Kitaru Kyakushu Yokai Dai Kesen, obviously. Uh, I probably should have practiced these before recording this, shouldn't I? But anyway, this one translates to Gigigi no Kitaru Counter-Attack The Great Demon War. This is based on a manga series about a kid with magic hair that fights demons and has a weird eyeball mate. Yeah, as you can probably tell, I have no idea what's actually going on here, but if this game is anything to go by, I do actually really want to find out, as this sort of thing is right up my alley. So this one plays kind of like a 2D shooter, with you taking control of the kid, who I think is Kitaru, and you use your deadly hair to shoot enemies. Or if you really want to show them who's boss, you can charge your shot and shoot your wooden clog thing at the enemies, which homes in on everyone on the screen, and you can also swat your jacket, which can be used to deflect projectiles. I recommend getting used to using this, as it'll save your ass quite often, and needs to be used against quite a few enemies and bosses. The graphics here are great, with a fantastic art style which I'm assuming matches the manga. Everything here has a really cool painted look to it, and the enemy designs in particular are really cool looking cross between something out of the Ghostbusters cartoon and where the wild things are. I really love it. The game starts out with a map screen and you'll have to open scrolls, which then open new areas on your map. Some of these have a flame on them, which means there's a demon spirit boss for you to fight. Once you defeat them, you'll open up new areas on the map to progress. There's other menus too, but I couldn't actually figure out what these were for, but I seem to be able to progress either way, so I don't think they're too vital. When you're in the levels, you'll be bombarded by dozens of enemies, but thankfully your attacks are pretty effective and you can even get spirit helpers that do some massive damage. These are a great help against bosses in particular. And yes, there are plenty of treacherous platforming sections which can be pretty damn tough, as sometimes you'll fall through platforms that you definitely think you've landed on. What also didn't help is that my controller started to play up while playing this game, and would often lock my movement in one direction for a couple of seconds. This made some levels stupidly hard, but, I have to reiterate, that wasn't the game's fault, that was my controller being a dick. The bosses here are the main attraction, and they're all really great, usually taking up the large amount of the screen, and they have weaknesses and patterns and weak spots that you'll need to discover if you want to beat them. And thankfully, you do have unlimited lives. However, be careful, because if you do die, you go back to your home, which is in the centre of the map, and you've got to make your way through all the previous stages to get to them. Any bosses that you've beaten do stay dead, so you just have to run through, avoiding the enemies that are there. There's no health pickups in the levels, instead, when you finish a stage, you get a few bars back on your health. 
This works quite well, and you'll need to pleat each level a few times to see which is the best way to get through it without taking any damage. There's a lot of cutscenes here, which of course are all in Japanese. Thankfully, they can be skipped with the select button, but I do kind of wish there was a translation, as I would love to know what was going on. The game has a really cool horror style to it, and it's very well made. I mean, it's by Konami, and you can really tell that it had a good amount of polish. This one is definitely recommended. Next up is Fun Goku Ninden, a 2D platform game based on the popular Monkey King story that has a ton of different games, movies, cartoons, etc. And it's even the inspiration for Dragon Ball. This 2D platform game uses pre-rendered sprites and lets you choose from one of three characters. You've got the monkey bloke, the pig bloke, and the turtle bird looking bloke. Each of the characters has their own attacks and stats, so the monkey bloke is the all-rounder, using his bow staff that can be used to attack up, down, left or right. Each character also has their own magic, and the monkey bloke fires a barrage of mini hymns that does massive damage. The pig bloke is the slowest of the characters, but has the most health. He's also pretty tough poking enemies with his big fork, and breathing fire for his magic. The magic here has pretty short range, but it does massive damage. Then there's the turtle bird bloke, who attacks with a claw thing. He can do diagonals, but not attack straight up. He's the fastest character, and can even do a double jump. He throws his hat like a frisbee for his magic attack. It doesn't really matter which character you choose, as actually they're all quite good to use, but I did find myself using the monkey bloke most of the time. Levels here are littered with enemies, which you can also throw, kind of like in Gunstar Heroes, and there's loads of other things in each level that you can toss at enemies too. The bosses especially will need a lot of stuff thrown in their faces. Most enemies drop these orbs, and there's also loads of them on the level to collect as well. You'll want to get as many of these as you can, as they're what you need to use your magic attacks, which use about 100 every time you fire them. But you'll do want to go easy, as at the end of each level, you spend the rest of the orbs that you've got to heal your party, and even to revive any dead ones, so it's often a toss-up of dealing death or curing it. The levels here are quite varied and all look okay. The pre-rendered graphics don't really hold up as well as hand-drawn sprites do, but they look fine. There's a good variety of enemies, and I do actually really like the bosses that you fight. They get pretty tough, and you'll need to figure them out by watching their patterns, which is something I learned the hard way. But really, it's not that tough a game, and I actually nearly beat it the first time I played. This is another game that isn't technically all that impressive or original, but it's well made, and honestly, I thought it was going to suck, but for some reason I just couldn't put it down after I started playing. It's another one that I would say is a bit of a hidden gem. Definitely not for everyone, but it's a good fun game, and if you think it looks cool, give it a try. Our last game that was only released in Japan, and is actually the game that inspired me to make this video, is The Adventures of Little Ralph. This one sees you playing as Ralph, a hero who has turned into a kid for reasons that I don't know because I can't speak Japanese. The thing is, it turns out that he doesn't lose any of his hero abilities, he just happens to be a bit shorter, kind of like Goku in Dragon Ball GT. So, as Ralph, you get to set off across a bunch of levels with your trusty sword, taking down demons and jumping a lot. The graphics here are great, and although there isn't a lot of stuff going on in all the levels, the characters look fantastic and they control really damn well. The combat here especially feels really good. You swing your sword to attack and it has a decent reach and does good damage to most enemies. You can also charge your shot for a more powerful attack. The charge attack also lets you send enemies flying across the screen, taking out anyone else in their way, and more importantly, it lets you reflect enemy projectiles, which I'm sure you've guessed comes in pretty handy against bosses. The levels here are fairly large with loads of paths you can take. You'll find power-ups that give you more powerful attacks or the ability to shoot fireballs, and you even get little creatures that will help you out. You can collect fruit for points, and there's hidden hearts all through the levels that appear when you touch a certain spot on the screen. Get five hearts and you'll get an extra life. You can't take many hits before you die. Basically, you've got that little blue thing that follows you around like a fairy. This allows you to take one hit, but once this gone, if you take another hit, you'll lose a life, which does mean the game can get pretty tough later on, especially against bosses, which, by the way, are always really good fun to fight. Thankfully though, you do have unlimited continues, though there's no save or password, but the checkpoint system is pretty forgiven. 
What is interesting is that the game doesn't break at all, and every level goes into the next without the screen of going to black or loading. This is a really cool touch, and it makes you follow the, every part of the journey. My only gripe is that the levels don't get too crazy for most of the game, and you'll be in boring towns or sewers for way longer than I would have liked. It would have been nice to see more of the interesting levels more early on, but that's really just a small nitpick. Again, this is a game that anyone can enjoy without needing to know any Japanese. Honestly, this really should have been released everywhere, but I'm guessing Sony's 3D policy is what held it back. This would have been a great series that probably could have even made the jump to 3D on the PS2 or later. This is a must play for any platform game fan. And finally for today, I know I've treated you to a ton of games here. This one is Rapid Reload, which did get a release outside of Japan. In this run and gun shooter, you choose from a couple of characters that play the exact same, and then you set out to commit genocide against some cute evil animal people. Now, if you've ever played Gunstar Heroes on the Mega Drive, or Genesis, if that's how you choose to live your life, then you're going to feel right at home here, as it plays very similarly. In fact, if you were to tell me it was a sequel, I would probably believe you. You start out with all your weapons, a spread shot, a homing laser, a flamethrower and grenade shots and you can switch between them at any time, which you'll need to do depending on the situation you're in as some weapons are better against certain enemies than others, or it might just be whichever weapon you prefer to use. Each of these has unlimited ammo but of course the range and damage they dish out does vary. Also if you get close enough to smaller enemies you can throw most of them which kills them right away. What's cool here, and I'm guessing is what the name is all about, is that enemies drop power-ups that build up your power timer. The higher the number here, the more damage your weapons do, and they even change slightly, so the more power you have with the spread gun for example, it goes from one shot to three, the homing weapon moves faster and stays on enemies longer, and the flame gets longer and so on. This is a really cool mechanic and ensures that you're constantly on the lookout for enemies to kill, as the timer is constantly clocking down. The bigger the enemy, the more power you get from them, and there's also an overdrive icon that powers your weapon fully. These are great and really make you feel invincible. Except you're not, so be careful. In fact, you only have one life and nine continues. If you die, you have to restart the level from the very beginning, even if you're on the boss. I'm not gonna lie, I ain't a fan of that. The game is a fair challenge though, and with some practice you'll be able to get pretty far taking down the bosses, which are all massive, and once again require you to learn their patterns if you want to stand a chance of beating them. The graphics here are great, and while they don't really show off what the 32-bit PS1 is capable of, it's definitely an upgrade from the 16-bit systems, and I always wanted to see what was coming up on the levels next, especially to see what the boss would be. Something that is absolutely criminal here though, is that the game is single player only. I really don't get this. There's two characters to choose from and I'm sure the PS1 could handle it. In fact, with the exception of Metal Slug X, every game on this video today is single player. Though that does kind of make sense for most of them. But this one would have been so much fun with a friend, and I hate it when games seem to take a step backwards. If Contra and Gunstar Heroes on the 16-bit systems could do two player co-op, then why not here? But, once again, that should not put you off playing this one, as it's a really fun game with solid controls, great graphics and a decent challenge. Another one I would highly recommend. So there you go, a whopping 10 2D games for you to enjoy on the PS1. I really love these games, and done right, 2D games are still some of the best around. They hold up way more than most 3D games of the time, and it's great to see so many indie developers making stunning 2D games for modern systems. It really is a shame that Sony discouraged developers from making them, as we could have seen some really impressive stuff. But anyway, what are some more 2D games for 32-bit systems that I should check out, in case we do a part 2 of this topic? Make sure you let us know in the comments below. On screen now, you can see where you can follow us, so why not do so? we got loads of great content for you to enjoy. Now, all that's left for me to say is thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.